Father, we ask that this morning that you bless the word, open the eyes of our understanding. We thank you that we have your grace, we have your spirit, and it's your design and desire to open the eyes of our understanding this morning as we get into your word. Liberate us, set us free, unveil Christ, transform our thinking, renew our minds, that we be conformed to the image of Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today um, is our first day that we're doing a dry run with the uh, Periscope. If you don't know what that is, um, they can view us live now on the internet, as well as us recording still on YouTube for later, as we upload it later today. They'll be able to still um, do that. So um, that's that's something the Lord's opened up, and you know what's nice about it, except for the fact that you got all this gap here. But we'll fix that. This is a dry run. Um, What's nice about this is, you know, we, I used to have a television show, but it was free because I worked for the TV station. But you know what it costs to be on TV. But the way technology is today, you can bypass TV. The apps today, smartphones, and do it for free. I mean, go from spending thousands upon thousands of dollars, and then you can do it for free. Now, not, not everybody's going to have an app. Not everybody's going to have a smartphone trying to get... Hollywood there to get a smartphone, but it's like pulling teeth. Not everybody's going to have it, but it's there for those who have it, and it can appropriate it. But again, this is a dry run. We're going to adjust the screen and adjust all that. This is just a dry run today. And um, the other thing I want to say in an introduction is that um, we're just trying to do whatever we can to get the message out. So, you know, we're coming up with ideas. We're doing whatever the Lord lays in our hearts to do and um, try to took a break off of Facebook for a while and um, probably will engage that again but on the level of just the church not my personal thing there um, just to get the message out again so um, if you got your Bibles this morning we're going to be Romans chapter 4 and this message today um, is something the Lord's stirred me for the last several weeks I didn't think that it was going to be something I was going to so much teach on but um, yet it just won't leave. And I uh, shared it with a couple people this week, just in sitting down in, in a meet, men's meeting that we had earlier this week. And here's what I want to open up with what grieves me. Because in the end of this, we're going to make this so practical that it should be easy for you to hear God and move in the Spirit. Why would God make that difficult? And what you hear, the teaching you hear today, makes it difficult. Number one, there's a, there's a group of people out there that believe that there's, if there's sin in your life, you can't hear God. Or that God's not going to answer your prayer. Well, when is there never not sin in our life? Huh? I mean, there's always an occasion of something happening, like, ah, oh, we screwed up there, we missed the mark. Sin is harmatia in the Greek. It means miss the mark. Who doesn't miss the mark? See, that's a perfectionistic doctrine of dotting your I's, crossing your T's, getting it just right with God, obeying God enough, fasting enough, praying enough, and hopefully out of, out of all of that, and plus your faith teachers adding all their little keys and principles and secrets of what you've got to do to get getting all of that right, it's a miracle anybody hears God or even gets anything from God. And you really think that God made it that difficult? No. If God, doesn't, if God didn't make it simple, then all the imperfectionistic people out there, they're imperfect, are wayside. Are you perfect? Well, then forget it. If you're not perfect, I hope one day 
that proverbial light bulb or that eyes of your understanding opens up and you realize that what the church is preaching is a perfectionistic doctrine. How many have heard teachings of, you know, we talked about fasting last week, that how much fasting is enough? How many have fasted and didn't get anything from God? Well, how does that make you feel? Frustrated? Makes you feel like a failure. Then you're like, well, maybe I needed to fast, throw more a couple of days on it. I was brought up in that doctrine, that perfectionistic doctrine. Maybe not sinless perfection, but how about putting in enough effort and works to get something from God? And both are wrong. Whether it's a sinless perfection or working to get something from God, prayer, fasting, obey the principles, the keys, the doctrines, whatever they lay at you. Work the word and the word works type thing. Right? I was brought up in that and it never worked for me. But I didn't have another message. I didn't have my eyes open to think, well, it's wrong. I thought I was, can't blame God. God's perfect, right? So if you fasted for something and prayed for something and had other believers pray with you and it didn't get answered, you can't blame God. He's perfect. How's God, how's God to blame? So you always blame yourself. And here's where you come down to. I didn't pray enough. I didn't fast enough. I didn't obey enough. Somewhere... And this is how the faith teachers always get out that there's some type of unbelief. There's something wrong with your faith. That's how they always get out of it. That they always criticize and judge and condemn your faith because it wasn't enough to receive that which you were seeking for from God. How many have been there? A couple weeks ago, I still periodically get emails from faith teachers I guess I had subscribed to years ago. And you know it's funny, you get you go to the bottom and say, unsubscribe me. And they do for a couple weeks. And then they put you back on. And I'm like, I don't want I don't want your stuff anymore. Yeah, but we want to still give it to you. So I unsubscribe and somehow that I end up some secretly somehow I, I my email subscribes to it again. So I'm, I'm looking at some of these faith teachers, even, and even some teachers that aren't even what you would call faith teachers, though they are, they wouldn't claim themselves to be. Here's what I want to show you today, because I want to set you free into a place of liberty and freedom in God to move. And like I said in the very beginning, if God made this difficult, we're all screwed. God made it easy to move, to hear Him and move in the anointing and have your breakthroughs and deliverances and your prayers answered. He has to make it easy or we're all screwed. Do you understand that? He has to make it easy or none of us is getting anywhere. Did Jesus make it easy for people to get healed when he was alive the three and a half years? I mean, his ministry, the three and a half years? Show me any hoop that he had them jump through to get healed, delivered, or any of that. They didn't even have to sow seeds, that big thing of seed sowing today. Sow a seed and God will move. They, he, Jesus never said that. The centurion said, speak the word. All you got to do, Jesus, speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus never raised money. He never gave him the law to obey. He never told him that, that you know, this, that or the other to get anything. He just said, just believe. And anybody can believe, can't you? Believe? That's not difficult. So I'm looking at these some of these emails that I can't get off their list. And and I'm getting getting really grieved and upset because here's here's this one guy's doing a webinar. Here's here's how he's gonna hook you. This is how they all hook you. What is it you are hoping for? Right away, I want to get you to the place where that turns, that turns your stomach. Just that statement. Can anybody tell me why that should turn your stomach? What are you hoping for? What are you believing God for? What is it your heart's desire is? 
Now at this point, that may not turn your stomach. When I say stomach, grieve your spirit. What's wrong with those statements? I, they all do it. That's how they hook you. Get my eight, eight CDs, eight videos, because I'm going to show you how you can, well, our, the father of the faith message, he's dead now, made this statement. You can write your own ticket. How many have heard that? You can write your own ticket. Confess enough, you can have it. We were joking around that they bought a new vehicle, and um, and they didn't, and they and they joked and said, "Well, I'm not that we named it and claimed it." Well, where does that come from? Name it and claim it. Nab it and grab it. That comes from that camp, the faith camp. You can write. This guy said you can write your own ticket. You know what that means? Whatever you want, sign your name. Your faith gets you things from God. How many have heard that? Faith is the currency of heaven. Like you've got to buy this stuff from God. I want to debunk it, man, because I'm going to tell you something right now. God did not create this thing to frustrate you. He made it so easy that you should be able to move in the anointing, pray and get results, and see things happen. So let me go back to this statement. What's wrong with that? What are you hoping for? What are you believing God for? What is your, desi your heart's desire? And then the thing was, I'm going to teach you how you can use your faith to get these things. What's wrong with that statement? Now you'd read that and go, ooh, that's going to be a good webinar. Let's watch it. But what's wrong with that? It's going to require you to do something, and that's where we're going to eventually, that's where we've been. Let me add something to what he just said. It puts you as the boss. It makes you the dictator to God. And, and I know there's going to be kickback from this, even maybe from some of you, because you probably weaned on the faith teachers. That's, I mean, they dominate the TV. And you know I can name them. And so this is going to probably challenge your theology. I hope that it does. So you can seek this stuff out and see if what I'm saying is true. Be a Berean today, like in the Acts. The Bereans said, Paul, wait a minute. Show us this in the Scripture. We're just not going to take it because you say it. Show us. And we're going to study the Scripture. We're going to find out what you're saying is true. But those kind of statements make you the dictator. God is not a slave to your desires. In fact, in Psalm 37 where it says He gives you the desires of your heart, you're, you've read that wrong. He's not a slave, a Santa Claus, to your desires. How do you read it then in Psalms 37? He gives you the desires. He births the desires in you. All of a sudden, remember we say you wake up with new drives and you wake up with new desires implanted by the Holy Spirit so those desires are now indicators on what God's bringing into your life. Not you dictating to Him what you want. God's faith is not you writing your own ticket and writing in what you want. And He's going to do it because your faith made Him do it. The thing about these faith teachers is why aren't we all millionaires? Why aren't we all prosperous and financially independent? Why is it the biggest preacher of this, who's dead now, Oral Roberts, God's Truth, Google it if you don't believe me, who created the seed faith movement, died owing $70 million. That, that, that really worked, didn't it? And he continued to preach that to the day he died. But the man owed $70 million. Yeah, but it works for Kenneth Copeland. His offering plates the world. If my offering plate was the world, you can't gauge somebody's theology by how much money they make and how many planes are in their hangar. That doesn't mean his theology is right. His offering plate is the world. 
and he's on every Christian television station, as all the other faith teachers are, and pulling in the money, and you think the message is right. No, they just got a huge, vast following dumping millions of dollars into their bank accounts. Doesn't mean the message is right. If the message was right, you'd be prosperous like him. But the problem is, you don't have faith like him. What, is he some super giant or something? Now, I, I'm not against, I'm not being adversarial this morning. I'm saying that I, I had the tapes, I listened to their messages, I read the books, it doesn't work. And all it did was bring condemnation to my life because I couldn't get what they said I should be having by now. Implementing all their little techniques and their laws and their steps and their secrets and their master keys. That's works, folks. And I'm going to show you a scripture. Let's just look, to, look at it right now. Romans 8, 32. I know I had you at Romans 4. Just go four more chapters over. Romans 8, 32. Why is this not preached? Because it is flat out against what they teach. I'll paraphrase it. And then maybe Daniel can give me the amplified version. If God did not withhold His Son, Jesus, will He not with His Son freely give us all things? Two words that a kindergarten kid would know and define. All means what? What's all mean? All things. Anybody knows. Kid knows all things means everything. Now Paul didn't want to say everything. He should just say certain things. He says all things come to us. And here's the second word. How? Free. Every welfare recipient knows what the word free is. Why do we don't understand about that scripture? What does the faith teachers and television evangelists don't understand about that scripture? Free. That means what's grace? Unmerited favor. You don't you don't merit the favor. I can't do enough to get the favor of God. It's automatically given to me for free. Unmerited favor. I get the favor of God for doing absolutely nothing. See, this was the struggle with Martin Luther. He said, he, he, he just could not understand Paul's teachings. And he beat on those scriptures. But as the author says, the book I was reading says, really the scriptures was beating on him. But what was it that he couldn't understand? He, can't, he had to come to the conclusion there is absolutely nothing you can do, number one, to get saved, to be justified, to be made righteous, or to receive blessing. He makes that clear on the blessing part in his commentary on Galatians in chapter 3. Faith is simply freely receiving. So hear me tell you what faith is. Let's say that I had $1,000 right here in my hand right now. And I say to my son, you want $1,000? Because it's he didn't manipulate me with faith. He didn't come here to church today and manipulate me with his faith or sob stories, what his needs were, complain or whatever, and pulled my emotions, so I'll, I guess I'll give him this thousand dollars. It's my will to give him a thousand dollars. What hoops does he have to jump through to get this thousand dollars? In the new covenant, nothing. I say, hey, I got you want a thousand? I'm giving you a thousand dollars. He has ears to hear, does he not? He's got two of them, one on each end of his head right now. If I said, Zach, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars, his response would be, oh, cool, but faith now. He has when he walked in here. Now you got to hear this. You got to hear this. When he walked in here, he did not have faith to get a thousand dollars from me because he didn't know I had a thousand dollars to give to him. He didn't know it was my will. To have a thousand dollars to give to him. So when he pulled up in the parking lot, there was no faith for a thousand dollars, was there? When did he have faith for a thousand dollars? When I told him. 
Exactly. I love it when you guys get this stuff right. Exactly. When I said, I have $1,000 for you, faith came. And now what's his response? There's only one. He better stick that hand out there. Or walk up here to get it. Is that a work? To go, okay. Is that a work? That's faith. Just to receive what I already said he gets for free. Now there's no conditions. I didn't say if you live right, if you treat your wife right, if you treat your daughter right, if you go to come to church for the next five Sundays. I'll, no, there's no conditions on that because it's free. If there was a restaurant open today that said free food, do you think there would be, would you take your wallet in there? So what don't we understand about this word free in Romans chapter 8, verse 32? What's the Amplified say? He who did not withhold or spare even his own son gave him up for us all. Okay. Will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all? Will he not freely and graciously, there's your grace, freely and graciously what? Give us all other things. Give us all other things. Why other? Besides Jesus. That means your healing, your deliverance, your provision, houses, cars. I don't, whatever it is He decides to give you. But you're not making that decision of what you want. So here's what's wrong with the, 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 the little bullet points on this email. What are you hoping for? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. It's not what I'm hoping for. It's what He has already decreed and determined I'm supposed to have. Let me tell you what the Lord showed me as I was meditating on this this morning. The faith teachers and most Christians have faith backwards. They, they're, uh, they're trying to understand faith by how they're approaching God. They're understanding faith from earth's perspective to heaven. And any time you do that, you have human thinking. And you're already at the opposite end of what Scripture is. Because Scripture is not human thinking. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 2 or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, one, chapter 2 of one of those Corinthian books says that the spiritual things cannot be ascertained by the human mind. It means you can't discern them, you can't understand them. So faith is not something your mind can understand. But your mind understands do this and get that. Doesn't it? But it's really hard for you to understand that I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to live in houses you didn't dwell, houses you didn't build. You're going to eat from the fruit of the vine you didn't plant. That's like, wait a minute. That's that. What do you mean? I'm going to get all this stuff for free? Now, this all makes sense at the end. So just just walk with me because I'm building a case here. I'm going to be a lawyer this morning. And you're the jury, and you're going to decide whether or not my case is strong enough for you to believe it. Okay? I'm going to build a case. Because once I'm done, two things. You're going to kick that back at me and go, I don't believe it. Or you're going to go, oh my God, this is easy. And I can't wait to start practicing it. Because it will be the most exciting thing. You don't, if you think God is boring, religion made him boring. You think he, is, he, you think he came up... I mean, he's God. He can make himself into whatever he could be, right? Why would he make himself boring? He's boring because your thought patterns are too human toward Him. So our faith is too humanistic toward Him. Let's look at faith from His point of view. Faith from our point of view is this. This is what I want, and I'm going to use my faith to get it. So what I'm doing is I'm scanning the earth. What do I want? I want that house. I want that job. I want that woman. I want this. I want that. And then I'm going to take all this stuff that I've found that I want on earth and take it to heaven and use my faith as currency to buy it from God. The things down here that I want. So I'll sow seeds like they tell me to. I'll jump through the secrets and keys and master plans they tell me to do in order to get that. Because their faith is always ends up being a work. Does it not? So, you know, and let me just pause. If I forget, someone remind me to, have to, to define faith from heaven's perspective. Can you remember, somebody remember to say heaven's perspective of faith? I, I would listen to these guys on TV. And the first half hour is all grace and faith, true faith. 
biblical faith. And that got me excited to receive from God. And then the last five minutes, they put the but. You ever had that happen? They put the but or the condition. Especially the telephones. Man, these telephones, they're, they're, I mean, they, these guys are preaching great. And it's grace and God's good. And, and then the end is, but you've got to sow this $58 gift. Or become a partner of said television station. And I'm like, you just... Or do these seven things. And it's like, that, I'm done. I can't... Okay, say I do those seven things. I didn't do them good enough. I could have done them better. Because I didn't get what I wanted from doing those seven things. I, have, I was the most frustrated man, man there was when I was under that message. So let's look at faith's definition from heaven. You know why God gives you faith? Remember what I used my son. He had no faith that I was going to give him $1,000 until he heard me speak. What's Romans 10, 17 say? Faith comes by hearing. hearing. If I don't hear it, faith can't come. God's words are spirit and truth. And they're filled with faith. So when God speaks to you, faith automatically comes. But if I tell you something and your human faith grabs a hold of it, then you want something you got to do to add to it and you never get it, it never works. But when God speaks, faith comes. Faith can't come no other way than hearing the Spirit who speaks words that are spirit and truth, filled with faith. So in other words, Romans 14, at the very end of Romans 14, that verse says, whatever you do, if you don't do it in faith, it's sin. That's even good things. So if I'm out there doing something, trying to get something, and it's not because I heard God say it, I'm not in faith, I'm in pseudo-faith. I'm in hyper faith. I'm in human faith. And that never works. Does that make sense? So faith comes by hearing. So how am I going to get faith? So in other words, faith, here's what God does. Here's, here's, the, here's the faith's definition, heavenly definition of faith. Is that God says, I want to give my people these things, whatever these things are. Faith is the way they're going to receive it. Because when they hear what I'm doing, they will believe it. Go to Genesis, not now, but in Genesis it says, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I know your, 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 your wife is barren. That means she can't have kids. How am I going to be the father of many nations if my wife is barren? Huh? But it says, Abraham believed God. And God said, because you believe the promise I give to you, you're righteous. He got the gift of righteousness because he believed what God was saying. We already have the gift of righteousness because we believe in Jesus. So now I come to the next thing, is that whatever God says to me, I hear it, then I believe that because if I heard it, faith will automatically be there. Right? Faith will automatically be there and then it will come. So faith on God, just try to see God from His perspective, from heaven. What He wants to bless you with. And He'll let you know what it is. He gives you the desire. He speaks it to you by dream or vision or by words. Remember we talked about many things, how God speaks. Faith comes and now you know it's yours. Now you might understand Hebrews 11 definition of faith. Which maybe we'll talk about next week or something if I continue this. So let me back up. Let me make the contrast again. Because once you get this, and, I, and I'm not going to try to be much longer here because this is huge. The religion's definition of faith, the earthly definition is, I look at the world, what do I want? And I go to God with it with a faith, what they call faith. And that's me calling the shots. That's me telling God as a dictator what I want. And faith makes God move. No. God already moved 2,000 years ago and declared an inheritance to you. And your everything, every blessing comes to you from that inheritance. And you don't earn an inheritance, right? 
I'm not going to teach on inheritance. You know, if somebody leaves you something, all you got to do is show up at the, at the lawyer's office and sign some papers, and you get it. Because it's inheritance. It's left to you for free. They worked for it, but you got it for free. Jesus worked for it on the cross. After the cross, everything's free now. It's called an inheritance. And the Bible, in Galatians especially, talks about a lot about inheritance. So God says, I have an inheritance. It's already done. I will supply all your needs. I've already mandated your life. I've already prearranged it. I know what you need. I know when you need it. And all you've got to do is hear me, and I will give it to you periodically as time goes and when needs arises. Now, am I boring you? Because when I get to the practical side and give you my side of it, my, my real life stories of this stuff, you're not going to believe. I mean, you're going to believe it, but you're not going to. You're going to. You're not going to be able to get out of here fast enough to start practicing it. I promise you. Here's the problem. Isn't it hot in here? Or is it just me? When when we were when we were young, there was a saying. She's hot in Texas. Man, it, I'm in Texas right now. We got that heat advisory today. And I got the tank top on. It ain't working. Tank top ain't working. And I ain't going naked. I'm not going to pull an Adam and Eve on you. But I'm hot. So anyway, um, the, one of the problems I have when it says, what is it you're hoping for? What is it you're desiring? What is it you want God to do? That makes me the dictator. And there's nowhere in Scripture, and I'm going to show some stuff to you real quick, and then I'm going to try to get through this quick enough so I don't bore you any further. But let me just show some things that the Bible declares who you are in comparison with God. Number one, potter and the clay. Does the clay tell the potter what to do? I don't care how much faith the clay has. The clay never says to God, I want that car, I want that house, I want that job, and then exercise my faith in keys and secrets to get God to do that. That is not the, that's not the potter and the clay analogy. The clay submits to everything that the potter is doing. Make sense? Let me give you another one. Does the son call, does the father call us sons? Tell me when a son tells a father what to do. In fact, the mother and the father decides when the kids get the gifts. For instance, you don't give a five-year-old a Corvette. You give him a tricycle. It's already in your head. It's, you've already got a plan out. These kids are going to start off with bike or maybe big wheels. Maybe there's no such thing as big wheels anymore. Is there big wheels today? Okay, you start them off with a big wheel. We started Zach off with that, that big four-wheel drive. Remember that truck? Had a battery? Bigfoot. He, he, didn't, he didn't get a big wheel. He got a Bigfoot. And then, we, then, then I, in my head, in my planning, we said, next is going to be a bicycle. And then went to school, had a bike, and then when he graduated from high school, what did you get? Well, before you graduated from high school, you got, he's 16. I remember you driving off your first job. In what? A car. Yeah, 10 speed. A car. He gets a car. You see? That's how God's doing with us. He's saying, he's looking at us, he knows what you have need of, he wants to bless you, and Timothy says he wants to give us all things to enjoy. I mean, like I said last week, this should be a party, guys, okay? And there are great things out there on the, in this world to enjoy, but they come from your inheritance, not you manipulating God. So a son never says to the father, I want this. I probably tried it with my own dad. Manipulated, cried, boo-hoo, and all that. We tried that. But the father has the final say-so, Right? Here's another one. He, the Bible calls us prisoners of the Lord. Since when does a prisoner tell the warden what they're going to do? There is not an analogy in the Bible, a type of shadow, where we ever dictate to God what we want, when we want, and how we want it. No matter how much faith we can muster up. Here's another one. Slaves. The Bible calls us slaves. Since when does a slave tell a master what to do? 
I don't care what the slave's desires are. That master doesn't care what the slave's desires are. That warden doesn't care what the desires of the prisoners are. Here's another one. Soldiers. He calls us soldiers. Does, does, does a sergeant care what the butt private wants? The Bible says we're citizens of heaven. Since when does a king take the dictates of the citizens? Well, you compare a king to citizens. Who rules and reigns? The citizens or the king? Except in the United States, of course. Thank God for that. But in the old days, the king ruled and reigned. How about this one? Ambassadors. The guy in Benghazi couldn't get the United States to give them more protection. No matter how much they cried and complained. So ambassadors don't tell those in leadership how to run a country, do they? I just gave you, the Bible calls us clay, sons, prisoners, slaves, soldiers, citizens, ambassadors. And then these faith teachers come along and make us on top and God on the bottom. Tell God what you want. Use your faith to get whatever you want. I'm here to tell you, you're not going to get whatever you want. You're going to get whatever your father has already decreed for you to have. And because he's a good father, you will never go without and you'll always get blessing from him. Because he's out to do you good. Alright? And I don't have time to get into this. But in Galatians chapter 3 and 4, it talks about everything God gives us is by promise. He doesn't give us things by law anymore. Everything's a promise. When God tells you something, it's going to come in the form of a promise, which means you don't do anything but wait for Him to release it to you in timing. He's not going to release a car to a five-year-old. So you're wanting things from God. I get that. And if, if there are things that God's birthed within you, all you can do is wait it out because it's timing. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 says, We inherit the promises through two things. Faith, which is simply receiving for free, it's just putting your hand out there to get it, and endurance, which means you have to endure the seasons of life that you go through until He releases it from heaven when He, when he deems it necessary. If He gives you some things right now you're not ready for, you'll destroy those things. I'm glad I didn't get a... I would, I would love to have had a Corvette at 16 years old with that 350 engine in it. And I'm... And I was, I, I'd be like, man, that'd be great. But if my parents would have given me a Corvette at 16, knowing the way that I drove at 16, I may have had that car wrapped around a tree. I didn't, I didn't need a big souped-up V8 in my immaturity at 16. So I got a four-cylinder. I eventually got to a V8, never wrapped that V8 around a tree, because you mature. There's guys like, I would love to give this thing to you right now, but you're not able to have it. You, there's things I want to teach you, there's maturity level, you've got to go up another level, and this is what sons do with their fathers, do with their sons. So don't get all peed off and mad, you don't get this, you don't got that. There's, you, if you have the revelation that God is out for your good and your good only and He's a good God out to do you good giving you things to enjoy you're just in a waiting mode. Some things you're not going to get because they're not part of the plan. Sorry, they're not part of the plan. Grow up. The clay don't say back to the potter what are you doing? And, that's, and this is where the faith teachers completely miss it and I believe their borderline heresy if not heresy is that they're telling you you can get things from God that's not his will now Jesus is the perfect example of this model that I'm sharing with you no time did Jesus ever dictate to God what he was to do in fact he turned it around and said I only do what I hear him say to do I only speak what I hear him say Jesus said, I do nothing apart from the Father. So everything you see in my life is, is a partnership with me and the Father. He's calling the shots, and I'm receiving those shots. I'm, I'm, I'm taking my cues from heaven. It's basically what Jesus said. And John the Baptist, if it doesn't come from heaven, what's he say? It's not mine. So I don't go to heaven with what I want on earth. I go to heaven to find out what's in my inheritance to be released on earth. 
problem is the faith teachers got us and more and most teachers on TV have us trying to find out what we want on earth take it to heaven and try to make a deal with God with our faith and obedience and then get it released back down here on earth it's backwards you don't look at earth you why do you think he says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not <coughs> want the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not covet. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. That means you never look on this earth and say, I want that. This is why Paul said, I would have not known sin. Listen to me. The faith teachers make you the biggest coveters there are. Paul said, I would have not known sin if it wasn't for that one law. Thou shalt not covet. That means, you really want to hear this? I pause because this is, this is strong. What does that commandment mean? Thou shall not covet. Boy, this is, this is liberating, but it's, it's tough. It's good, but man, your flesh is going to kick back at me. All right, here we go. That means, thou shall not covet means, I cannot open up that real estate magazine and say, God, that's the house I want. Because I just coveted something. I can't drive onto a parking, a, a, a car lot, and say, God, that's the car I want. I can't go to a bar and say, God, that's the woman I want. I can't even drive by a church and go, that is a nice church. Lord, I want to go to that church. I can't even do that. If I'm wrong, then tell me what it means to want something, to covet. He's my shepherd. I should never be in a state of coveting, which is wanting. And that nails every one of us. And that's why Paul said, I would not have known sin had it not been that one damn commandment that exposes my wants. Well, then how am I ever supposed to get a house? How am I ever supposed to get a car? How am I supposed to ever get a wife? Does anybody know? Is it clicking yet? Let me walk this through you, with you. Does God know your needs before you ask? The Bible says He does. Right? So, is God out for your good? Does He want you to enjoy all good things? See, that's the premise you've got to start with. If you think he's a poor God, a pathetic God, a boring God, a God that holds back, well then no wonder you're out here trying to get in your own flesh things. But if you say, wait a minute, he's, he, he's, I already have an inheritance, so I don't have to go work for one. It's already <clears throat> in heaven, reserved in heaven. We've looked at these scriptures before. There's, a, there's an inheritance in heaven, reserved, made ready for you. And how do you get it? believing for it and he dispenses it as a loving father when you have need of it so how do I get a, how do I get a house the spirit will tell you wake you up and say it's time to buy a new house and then you'll start looking and then all of a sudden you'll see a house and your spirit will leap and then you will know that you know that you know that's the house. Let me give an example. I have a car. It's a 2003 Saturn View SUV. It's got close to 200,000 miles on it. Just started smoking. I know I'm going to have to get a vehicle. I know it. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to get a vehicle. Things don't last forever. The shoes you're wearing right now aren't going to last you forever, and neither is the car you're driving. I knew it, but I did not want to get into debt. I did not want to go do all that play all that game and have a car payment again because I bought that brand new. I said I would never have another five-year loan again because it just, 
I didn't want it. So I had a mentality, a fleshly mentality of what I wanted. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. All right? That's me. So I'm out on the river just before God. I'm not really praying. I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just enjoying God, enjoying the day. I'm out on the river, and the Spirit says to me, out of the blue, go get your vehicle. I heard it as loud in my spirit and I wasn't even looking I have never been on a car I can't tell you last time I was on a car lot looking for cars I can't tell you we're talking over 10 years I don't want a new car I don't want I, I, I'm happy with that if that thing would last me 20 more years I would keep it so I'm not asking God for a car I've not prayed for a car like you know a new car or whatever and I just know someday I'm going to have to cross that bridge. And I hate that day when it comes because I know how. I bought lemons. How many have bought a lemon before? God, it could be a lemon. You know, you don't know who had it, who ran the hell out of it, or anything like that. So I'm on the river, and the Spirit says, Go get your vehicle. That was four o'clock on a Wednesday. By the time I got back into the shore and loaded my kayak up, got back here to the church, unloaded it, and by the time I got, I thought, well, you know, I don't feel no resistance. My flesh isn't even arguing it right now. What happened was, when he said, go get your vehicle, there was a faith that I didn't have before. Now, had the faith teacher helped me muster up some human faith, I'd had a, I could have got a lemon, could have got something I shouldn't have got, been in, been in pro, had a problem. But there was faith. There was no resistance in my spirit to what I heard. So I thought, I'll go look around. The very first car lot I went on, when I saw that vehicle, the spirit in me said, that's it. That's the one. And I, I didn't have to look inside. I didn't have to drive it. Didn't, I, didn't, I had faith because the spirit says, there it is. Wednesday at 4 o'clock, God says, go get your vehicle. I had it 1 o'clock by the next day. Buy a bank that I would never thought I could get a loan through with the best interest rates that are out there. Without a cosigner, without jumping through hoops, without anything. Supernaturally, God did it that quick, that fast. Now, see, I didn't go on that car lot and coveted that vehicle. Now, had I been driving on car lots, oh, I want that, oh, I want that, then I'm thinking about ways and means of how to get that. Now I'm conniving. I'm going to banks. I'm trying to get loans. Wait. If you truly believe house, car, wife, God did it with a with, with girl. He's already showed me things about my next wife. That when she shows up, I know that it's her. And some of you already know that. Because he doesn't want me out there coveting different girls. <coughs> you don't believe that, do you? That's how it works. So how's it come exciting? So you table everything your flesh wants. You table it. And say, Lord, you know my needs. We're just going to enjoy you. We're going to live out our lives in the existence that we're in right now. And if you want to move us, get me another job, get me another vehicle, get me another girlfriend, not another wife, but at least another girlfriend. Whatever you want to maneuver and change around, I table everything. Because you're my shepherd. I don't want nothing except what you've already decreed and determined I'm to have because you're my shepherd. And I won't ever have to want anything because you know what I have need of before I even ask. You've already been to my tomorrow. How many of you driving the car right now you know you're going to have to trade in someday real soon or around the corner? Just know that God's already been there. He's the God of the forefront. He's not in time. He's already been there. You know what the funny thing is about that vehicle? That vehicle only been there for like three weeks. He, I mean, just got there. By the time they you know, got there, traded in, by the time they got it through the shop, got it where they wanted it, put the new tires, brakes, it's a used vehicle, but it's new to me. By the time they had it ready, God said, go get it. It's sitting there, and now it's ready. The timing was impeccable. I could have never made that timing up. There was no other truck on that lot I wanted. There wasn't. I'm like, yeah, that's okay. But nothing in me that leaped and said, that's it. And man, you can just feel it. You can sense it. 
See, that's when he said no coveting and no wanting, you are at that point putting all your faith in that the Father has all your needs already met, all your wants already, all the desires he'll birth within you. That's how he'll lead and guide you. And all of a sudden you wake up, I want a new job. I used to love this job. I, now that's a desire he's placed in there so you can start talking to him about, okay, what's my next move? Don't quit it. Don't quit the job. Just say, Lord, talk to me about this. See, I've always taught you when we go, to, we, go to, we go to heaven to find out, what's the prayer? On earth as it is in heaven. So I go to heaven, that means prayer, communion with the Father, to find out what He's already made by way of blueprint for my life. What's in my inheritance? I find out what it is, I hear what it is, He puts the desire in there, then I can now be aware that this is about what He's ready to do, what He's going to do, how He's going to do it, and then I just flow in it, folks. And there's no work. It's all rest. And when God does the stuff, it flows. The blessing of the Lord makes us rich. He adds no sorrow to it. There's no toil and there's no tears when the blessing, God's blessing, comes. But if you try to engineer and orchestrate something, man, try to force something to happen, you know you're doing it. And then, you, and then afterwards you think, man, I shouldn't have done that. But you're stuck with it now. You bought it. You married it, what have you. <clears throat> That's true. I mean, it really is. I, you know, can I say something and be the very non... Not all marriages are made in heaven. Come on. Why do you think there's so much divorce? Because we have married Ishmael's. We didn't hear God. That's the one. We didn't hear that. And not that you're always going to hear it. You'll have a desire. And then you'll pray. And there'll be no red flags. There'll be a peace. And then you'll know that's God too. There's many ways to hear God. I'm telling you now, here's how it becomes exciting. I mean, there's all kinds of scriptures, but... Here's how it becomes exciting. You leave here today. Now, let's make this practical. You leave here today with a clean slate, an empty slate. And you say to God, What are you doing? What do you say? You've given me the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me into all truth. Right? So this makes you have a relationship with God. <clears throat> Formulas, keys, secrets. You don't need a relationship with God. You just need to do these three things and then something happens. But I, the way, I'm, the, way the Bible declares it to be, which I believe that's what I just taught, is that you talk to the Father every day. And then you just go about your business. You got the daily grind. Y'all got a daily grind. Do it. Do the daily grind. And it's in that daily grind, boom, out of the blue, go get your house. That's the house. That's the car. That's the job. That's this. That's that. You know, or you got a bill you can't pay right now. And there's no money in the bank to pay that bill. <coughs> Don't start quoting scripture and try to use your faith to get that bill paid. My God shall supply all my needs. I've already got the promise of that. So you go to the Father and say, Lord, talk to me about this bill. This requires you to talk to God and hear Him. And that's the kind of relationship Jesus had with the Father. Seeing what He was doing and hearing what He was doing. And I, you're no different. You're no different. Religion keeps you away from God into laws and do's and don'ts and secrets and keys. The true thing God says, He did away with the law, gave you the Holy Spirit so you can commune with Him and find out exactly what He's doing on a day-to-day -day basis in your life. You can go to heaven and find out what He's doing. Access the throne. What's it say in Hebrews? You go to the throne of grace, unmerited favor in time of need. That's what the throne is for. In time of need. Unmerited favor. Go to your daddy. Go to your father who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He's got a, you can only think of one or two ways he can get a vehicle to you. He's got a million ways to get a vehicle to you. <coughs> you think, ah, there's no women out there. I can't find anybody. I don't want to go to bars. The only place they meet women is in a bar. There's a million ways he can get a, he can get a spouse to you. You just got to hear what he's doing. He told me in 1995 that I was going to be the next pastor of this particular church. In nine months, I became the pastor of that church. In 1998, 
he told me I'm going to, because I took off and, and took a sabbatical, left. I didn't even want to go back to preaching. I was done, burned out. And then he told me in 1998 that he was going to call me back into the ministry. I didn't go knocking on doors. A week later, a guy calls me, wants me to come to this church and preach. Two weeks later, he says, I'm, I'm resigning. They want you to be the pastor. I heard what he was doing. I, last year, I don't think I even told you this. Last May, he said, I'm in, my, I'm in my house. I own a house in Clarksburg, and I'm in that house. And he says to me, you're going to be moving. He didn't say, I'm going to sell the house. He didn't say, he says, you're going to be moving. See all this stuff? You're going to be moving. I heard that. The way it was transitioned and the way things happened, I was, I was moved out of that house. I still own it. But I was moved out of that house three months later. August of last year. I knew. See, he wants to tell you what he's doing, but you've got to have ears to hear. But see, me, you, tr traditional thinking is, i got to get out of this house. I'm tired of it. I don't want it anymore. How am I going to get out of it? I've had this car for two years. It's got 30000 I want another one. See, that's just, that's just human thinking, man. That's not kingdom. Kingdom thinking is God doing the thinking through you. God calling the shots. You're the clay. He's the potter. And He knows what you have need of. And He will always supply according to His riches and glory, not according to your obedience, how much you fast, how much you pray, how much faith you have. No, it's according to His riches and glory. And the faith will be there when He tells you to go get it, when it's yours, what to have, how to do it. Faith will always be there. You don't have to muster faith up. It comes with the speaking. It's in the package of His words. Isn't that liberating that you... Remember people always used to say you don't have enough faith? That's because you're trying to do things on your own. But when God says, walk on water, when Peter heard Jesus say, walk on water, he didn't have to build his faith up. It was there, instantaneous, and the boy got out of the boat and walked on water. It's when he started looking at the world, which was what would be the wave that he started sinking when he got his eyes off of the words that Jesus spoke. Here's how, and I'm done. Here's how it's going to be exciting. Walk in the Spirit. What does that mean, walk in the Spirit? Walk with the Father. Like Adam did in the cool of the evening, every day in the garden. Hear what he has to say. Say, Lord, what are you releasing to me today? What are you releasing into my life by way of the inheritance that Jesus bought and paid for 2,000 years ago that's mine freely? Just know that just as in the land of Canaan, everything is free. Everything's already provided for. Everything is free in your life from this point all the way to the day you die. And all you've got to do is hear God release it to you from heaven. Get it by way of desire. Get it by word. Now, either I didn't teach this right, or you're not getting it. I don't know which, which it is. I want you, man, do you, and I'm going to close with this. Do you think God created this thing to be boring and hard to do? How, how easy is it to hear your father say, go get a vehicle? How easy is it to hear God say, that's, the, that's your next wife or husband? How easy is it for God to just bring things into your life? All things are possible, right? So nothing's too hard for God to do in bringing things into your life. How happy would kids be if Christmas was every day? They'd wake up every morning anticipating what is under that tree, right or wrong. You have an inheritance being released to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Hearing God is your inheritance. Healing is your inheritance. Just keep yourself before the Father, the throne of grace, to hear what He has to say. Jesus said, hear Him. This is, this is the Father. Hear Him. This is my Son. Hear Him. You'll, you, you'll be driving down the highway, not even thinking about God, not thinking about anything, and boom, He'll release something to you out of your inheritance. Like the kid. He wakes up and there's a bike, a tricycle, or a big wheel. 
Then he wakes up and there's a car. Then he wakes up and there's a wife. I mean, God is ordaining your footsteps. He's already got your spouse. He's already got your jobs. He's already got your cars. He's already got your houses. Everything. If you see, if you see the Old Testament as something that we're to look at, and the, and the land of Canaan is the all-inclusive Christ, there is nothing in the land of Canaan that they're, when they get there, they'll ever need. Everything is in that land that they will ever need. Everything you will ever need in life is in Jesus. And you access it by just receiving. Hearing Him and then receiving. And through faith and endurance. Endurance is meaning you may not get it this year. The spouse may not come this year. The job may not, new job may not come for another two years. But you know going into the thing, I'm going to get everything I'm supposed to get because I've got a heavenly Father who's out to do me good. Amen? So, let me summarize this. Do not be duped by these faith teachers in you thinking that you're going to dictate to God what you're going to get in life. Because it's already determined what you're going to get in life. We can show you scriptures all day long to show you that. Your job is to hear. Believe that you have an inheritance. And all the promises of God are yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1.20 and you just wait for God to release those promises to you on a day-to-day, year-to-year, month-to-month, day-by-day basis. You don't use your faith to get things from God. God freely gives you those things, and faith comes when He releases them to you. I just liberated you from that faith message of working on your faith and fasting. You don't fast to get anything. It's freely given. This is too good to be true, isn't it? It can't... I mean, I remember my brother-in-law years ago said to me, Greg, nothing's for free. And he's right in this world. There's always strings attached. Nothing's for free. But in the kingdom, everything is free. And that is just too good to be true, and that's why it's called good news. So just saying, God, what do you freely bring into my life? You're, you, you're calling the shots. I'm the clay, you're the potter. You're the Father, I'm the Son. Hey, what are you doing? And I'll receive whatever it is. Because I know you've got my best interest at heart. Heavenly Father. Open the eyes. Tear down the sacred cows and the barriers of traditions of men. And the teachings and doctrines of men. And show us what true grace is. And faith simply receives what grace unconditionally gives us. Faith receives. It doesn't work. It receives. So Lord, all of our needs are met. You've already, you're the God of the forefront. You've already been to our tomorrow. You've already been to our next year. You've already been five years down the road. I don't need a five-year plan or a ten-year plan. You are my plan. And you've already been there five, ten years from now. You're just releasing it. That's why the Hebrew says we're receiving a kingdom. We're not, we just get it. We're receiving it. It's being, it's being allotted to us, our inheritance, the kingdom, day by day by day. God, this is exciting. Now, we're excited to hear what you're doing and what you're speaking and where you're leading and guiding us. So we ask you to give us a revelation of this mighty, powerful truth today. Amen. Amen. Hey, don't forget to share that. With, you know, We're on Periscope now and everything. Um, share it with people that, you know, that maybe they don't want to come to church. They can watch us live now. I think that's awesome, exciting. God bless you. See you next week.